Okay, hello everyone. <clears throat> it's been a while. I know we had midterm and then we had a holiday and then I was sick. So some of you are wondering what's going on. Um, <clears throat> well, I couldn't, <laughs> I lost my voice. Um, on last week, I lost my voice and um, you can probably tell I still don't sound completely normal. I was coughing a lot and I just uh, couldn't say anything um, and so Friday we had no class so I'm going to do Friday's lecture after this one and then I still have to catch up one more lecture we'll see how many I can do today um, I've been known to do three in a day so I might be wearing the same clothes but um, I might be releasing these one by one so that you can watch them in order we are <clears throat> halfway through the course we did the midterm. As I, I explained to you, mostly um, we talk about British, you know, culture the first half of the class, and then we talk about American culture the second half. But um, we go, we're going to go back and forth a little bit because, of course, um, the British cult culture still exists. And uh, before 1776 or 1783 or 1620, whatever date you want to use, uh, before that America um, was not, um, didn't exist, D didn't have a culture, didn't, wasn't a nation. There were other people there and they now contribute to what um, we call American culture. So the title for today's lecture is um, America Living Bravely. Uh, I normally don't choose titles that are so uh, positive or you might say biased or something like that. But uh, I'm going to say some, I'm going to explore a lot of negative things about uh, the United States development. Um, so we'll go back and forth uh, with the positive and the negative stuff. So most of you are Korean. Some of you are from other um, Asian or European countries. I don't think there's anybody from North America like me, um, but of course I'm a descendant of uh, people that moved to Canada from from the United Kingdom. So um, Canada was a part of this, you know, we have a culture that's very similar to American. Um, North, we, there's North American culture, which primarily is, we have the Caribbean, um, Central America, Mexico, Canada, and the United States so is kind of like five, I guess, regions you could say contribute to America um, as a North America as a continent. We are not going to talk about Canada very much, unfortunately for me, because I am Canadian. Um, but I've been studying American culture uh, academically, and I haven't done that with Canadian culture so much. Canadian culture is something I experienced, not something that I studied in university. So um, I'm more of an expert on American culture than I am on my own, I think. So I've, I've uh, followed a lot of different history professors and uh, literature professors over the years. Uh, there's a group of three uh, American, I just want to say before I start into this that they really influenced me after I wrote this book. Um, so the next edition will certainly include um, some references to them as I add the material because this is not in the textbook. Okay, these so we're going to start with these five points and it's not in the textbook. We're on chapter four, it's called the hard fork and really. A hard fork means uh, a fork in the road, right? Not an actual fork, but uh, this is a fork where, you know, one path is continuing on the same sort of trajectory, trajectory, <laughs> trajectory, uh, I can't speak. And uh, the other one is going off on a tangent in a different direction, right? This is called trajectory. I didn't realize it was so hard to say because I usually don't say it, usually you, you write it. So it's, you're expected, maybe the, there was a potential path where British and American culture was one thing, and it was. Um, 
for about 200 years, but um, they decided independence was um, an important step for America to take because they, they didn't want to be, they didn't want to follow the rules um, that were imposed by um, British culture and by Great Britain. Coincidentally, um, the three professors that taught the course that I relied on, it's from the great courses, uh, I listened to it on Audible. Um, I re highly recommend Audible for listening to audiobooks. It's a great application. And uh, the third guy is British and he teaches 20th century um, American history as well as British Victorian history. So he's kind of like me, although he's British, not a Canadian. I'm kind of a third party, but um, he's not the one who emphasizes this is an American professor. Uh, his name's uh, Alan Gals Gelzo, and um, he, it's his idea, not mine. So I want to give credit where credit is due. Just like I said, um, some of the stuff about, especially about the 17th century, about uh, James and Charles the first, Charles the second, and glorious revolution stuff, the stuff we just finished, um, that was Robert Buckles. Uh, was a professor I've listened to his lectures he's an expert on the Stuarts so uh, I learned a lot from him too so I have put, I'll put the book down <clears throat> for a minute and uh, let's talk about American ideals okay uh, everybody knows even when I said in class earlier this year like what do you think uh, is a rep representative thing what do you think of first when you talk about America they um, Freedom is the sort of buzzword that you hear all the time. It's a different kind of freedom though, I have to emphasize. It's a different kind of freedom than the kind of freedom we would expect uh, in other countries like European countries, for example. You, you have a social obligation uh, when you live in Canada or you live in uh, even in the United Kingdom, there's sort of a public social obligation that you have that everybody follows. And Korea's even more like that, I think, where Korean culture emphasizes unity and cooperation and teamwork and respecting, you know, the family and society. Uh, I'm not saying that Americans don't do that, but their their freedom includes all kinds of different versions of it. Like one of their freedoms is um, the right to have a gun. Um, but, you know, there's kind of a problem here. And I'm going to talk about this later, uh, next on Friday. I'm going to talk about this later, but we're going to talk about a contradiction. When things seem like they are... Um, unable to reconcile, things are opposed to each other, we call it a contradiction. Uh, America is full of those kind of contradictions. And one of the ways that Americans resolve that is that um, I can do what I want. Uh, and and I'm, I can be, I can choose not to be free. <laughs> I can choose to be like the Puritans, uh, eat, eat, what do I always say? Eat, work, and sleep, pray, right? That, and nothing else. You, you have a, that's a choice that you can make when you go to United, the United States. You're supposed to have the freedom to practice your own religion, right? Um, you're, you're allowed to have a weapon. You're allowed to have a gun. You're allowed to do what you want on your land, on, in your space with yourself. You can do whatever you want. You get in trouble, obviously, if you um, cause some problems there are laws and everything like that but it's a fundamental thing about American society is that if you go to America you can be who you want to be and do what you want to do and frequently conservative values don't uh, accommodate those things but America is constantly uh, sort of struggling with itself almost like a, I've heard um, some uh, actually it was a a podcaster named Dan Carlin, uh, he does an amazing history podcast called uh, Hardcore History. And he was the one who said, described America 
for me as a, a two-headed monster. Uh, two things that's always struggling. Like when America has a war, there's always a peace protest faction against it. And whenever uh, there's an election, there's two parties and there's always, there's always some contradiction, some issues, some, some tension in American society. society. It's always like that. Um, so we can call it the two-headed monster, or you can talk, you can call it American contradictions, right? They have the another good example is their healthcare system. Um, if you're rich, America has the best healthcare system in the world. If you're poor and you don't have insurance, it's ter it's way down the list. Uh, you know, it's it will be out of the top, you know, fifty countries in terms of medical care offered. So um, the prison system is another one. There's a lot of Americans in prison and that's not free. That's not a free country. If you have 2 million people in jail, it's not a free country. So th these, these are ideals, right? Remember, it's just, it's not the reality of American society or the way it works now. It's just this, this ideal has existed since the very beginning of the, the first colonists coming to America and it keeps coming up. It keeps reinventing itself and it keeps making its way into new issues because people, American people use this as an argument, right? When they go to war with another country, it's, it's to um, protect the free world, right? And there's some problems with that behavior too because you're actually, you know, projecting your power in sort of almost like an empire, pseudo empire type style where you're giving money and you're using your military power and your political and economic power to control other people. We are going to talk about imperialism because, of course, uh, the British do build an, an empire and that's what they call it. But um, the American empire, they they don't like that word. They don't like um, imperialism and they fought to be free of that and yet there's some very very you know similar sort of manifestations um, of British and American culture and the way that they deal you know or have dealt because it was the British before that sort of had this global system uh, and then now the, the Americans have and now other countries are trying to do the same thing. China, for example, you can't blame them for trying to influence other countries um, in order to promote their own plan because that's what every country is with every country with a lot of power has done. So the free, freedom is a very flexible term, but everybody you know, who's American or not American has the idea that if you were an American citizen um, or that you visit America, that uh, freedom is a fundamental quality of American society and American culture. The second one, uh, I, I was surprised to hear at first because I've lived in Korea for a long time and Korea is sort of a, uh, what we'd say, hyper, hyper, sensitive country when it comes to education. I think that's probably the number one reason why there's not as many Korean children these days is because education is so expensive. Taking, you know, if you have multiple kids, you have to make sure that um, they get an opportunity. Um, and the way that Koreans believe that you can do that is through education. Uh, and that's actually Americans too. It's just the American public public system has sort of deteriorated, but <clears throat> that's now, right? Throughout, if you look at the whole history of the United States from, we'll say 1620, okay, until now. So it's uh, 1620 is when um, actually the first uh, Africans were brought to uh, the United States and that's why I'm choosing that date because there are African-American um, professors who they consider that the the beginning of the formation of the current American system that 
that's when um, slavery became a, a part of American culture and then subsequently um, importing millions of people uh, from another country, uh, from other countries in, in another continent, Africa, to America, which now, you know, um, they make up a significant portion of the United States uh, and, and have influenced American history a lot. <clears throat> so how access to education at the beginning, I mean, was it, just like England, it was religiously oriented. So a lot of um, American people read the Bible first, and then they read other things, um, like our friends Isaac Newton and John Locke. Um, Benjamin Franklin will come along in a lecture in the future, uh, another sort of genius, uh, multi-talented genius, linguistically, you know, scientifically, um, and successful businessman and politician and everything. Benjamin Franklin's quite an exceptional person. Um, he's, he was self-educated though. Uh, he didn't go to Harvard or Oxford or, or Yale or Princeton. Um, but there's a lot of people who did. Uh, Harvard is usually ranked the number one, uh, school in the world. And Yale is shortly behind that. Usually it goes, um, Harvard, Yale, Oxford, Cambridge, the top four usually don't move that much uh, in the global rankings. And that concentration of intellectual um, capital and um, high level education and professionalism um, exists in other, I, I just named Princeton and Yale, and you can keep going, Stanford, um, University of California, Berkeley, Cornell, there's a lot of really well-known, well very um, established, uh, important universities in America. And that's why you see, you know, a lot of international students going to America to do their um, graduate degree, master's degree, or their PhD, right? PAXA, they, they go there because there's an the institutional base of education has been there for a long time and it's very well developed it's it's this thing this ideal though also has its contradictions because basically the vast majority of people don't go to harvard or go to a, an ivy league school the vast majority of people try to go to get a college education just like koreans do um, it's very expensive though, and often their parents can't cover their, the costs of their education, so they borrow a lot of money. Um, and, you know, there's a bit of a problem in America um, with student debt. Some politicians have suggested that they need to cancel it um, because it's getting so out of control and education has become too expensive. But in the beginning, Americans emphasized education and so it's a, it's a fundamental ideal of American society that education leads to the other things. Yeah, education leads to success, opportunity, freedom, right? Um, opportunity means you can have, you have choices about what you're going to do. Um, so that's the second ideal. You can see here, we're going to do several E's. If you want to memorize something, I noticed it's a long time ago now. On somebody's exam, they just wrote um, R, G, V, N on their midterm exam because this is Romans, Germans, Vikings, Nor uh, Normans, right? Mm -hmm. Those are the four invaders, invading people um, in, in England over the first millennium. So they just remember, just, I don't really want you to memorize stuff this way, but it does turn out that you can get um, an ac you can get an acronym out of this too. A F E E E, right? Sorry, F E E E P. Don't include the A. That's the title. Freedom, education, except exceptionalism, experimentalism, and popular government. Um, <clears throat> so the third thing before I make this lecture too long, 
Um, exceptionalism means that it's exactly what you think if you look it up in the dictionary. An exception means uh, a special case. So this is not a negative thing for Americans. It means that they think they're special and that they have a destiny to be a great country. And this belief has helped them um, develop and fulfill, you know, some of their goals. Uh, from the outside, for all of us who are not American, um, it expresses itself sometimes as, as being proud or selfish or overconfident or something like that. Um, so we don't usually like the attitude because, yeah, it's a bit arrogant, you might say, to, it's a bit of an arrogant attitude that I'm better than everybody else. Uh, but this, this has helped um, the United States stay unified. Sometimes I wonder how the United States is, still exists under a system which promotes freedom and ideals and um, in some cases d diversity, right? Like doing things differently is, is a good thing. And so how can you become, how can you be a unified country if everybody's got a different opinion? Somehow they make this work. It's another example of contradictions, I guess. But it's much more common for a big territory to have like a more, a stricter, you know, more centralized power system than America has. And you can see sometimes there's fights between states and the, the federal government. Um, that doesn't usually happen in other countries. In Korea, you never hear in the news that the, the governor of Chungcheong province is um, disagreeing with the president. It doesn't happen. During COVID, all of the rules for each province in Korea were the same. And I'm assuming in, in most countries that was the case. But in America, it wasn't. Each state got to make its own rules. And in Canada, we do this, a similar thing. This, uh, one of the one of the good things and the bad things about the, uh, Canada that is similar with the United States is that um, we are in our provincial governments have a, a lot of power. For example, have the power have the power of education and healthcare, um, not the national government. So it, it's it's a system that you would think would make cause a lot of problems, but um, it also, in general, makes people happier because it freedom is something that human beings desire, right? And so all of these things so far, they fit together pretty well, even though there's lots of contradictions and there's lots of people who are not fortunate to have the same, be able to achieve these ideals. They, it, ideals exist and that, that, that's what they're trying to do. Experimentalism is doing experiments, trying something new, inventing something. Benjamin Franklin, again, pretty good example, flying a kite, trying to make, you know, lightning um, hit objects uh, in, the, in the air and then, you know, so consequently inventing uh, the lightning rod, um, just a pretty simple device that you put on top of your roof and it, it, the, the metal line goes from the roof down to the ground. So the lightning electricity travels through the ground, through the, through the conductor, the metal conductor, and doesn't cause damage to your house or kill somebody who's taking a shower when uh, there's a thunderstorm. You don't have to worry about that anymore. Um, so experimenting, I mean, America itself, the country is an experiment. Originally, it was an experiment. No other country was, has been that big and um, tried to become a democracy um, or a republic uh, in human history. Americans were the, the first to do that. They, it happened before the French Revolution. Uh, and France, although the population was bigger, um, France uh, geographically much smaller. Um, but anyway, um, the French Revolution and the American Revolution are very closely linked because the French actually helped the Americans um, achieve their independence. So we'll have to talk about that too. The last one is popular government. And like I said, this is another thing. Um, it, it becomes a value related to freedom uh, that 
you have um, you have the right to cast a vote for whoever you want, um, even if that person is a bad person. We've had some pretty bad presidents and some pretty bad uh, politicians who have won by being popular. Um, that's the downside, obviously. The the upside of it is that you they're so supposed to be representative of the people's, you know, what people need and what people want. That's how they um, can express, they're able to express themselves in America politically if they choose. Um, there's lots of problems with the system, obviously, but there's a line pretty much. And I'm glad there is a line because of two years ago, um, there was a president who tried to use um, a riot in a protest and and lied about the results of the election uh, in order to remain president even though he had lost and you probably know I'm talking about Donald Trump um, but the American people were unwilling to support his desire to be basically a, an authoritarian leader and uh, although there was thousands of people that tried to help do that and they stormed Capitol Hill, in the end, the American people have rejected that uh, course of action. And I, I think personally, it's a very scary thing when the United States becomes a place that um, ha has a powerful ruler that can do whatever they want. Um, it doesn't matter who the president is, whether it's Joe Biden or Obama or Abraham Lincoln or George Washington. I think there's, we, we always have to be careful uh, about the leadership of countries and whether they have a system that is balanced, right? So popular government means that, you know, whoever's in, in the lead, um, again, education and freedom and feeling you're special and all these values put them together, and then you're supposed to have an intelligent society that votes um, for the right people and that you have the right people leading. And that's not what always happens, but that's the ideal, is that popular government would be representative. That's why it's called Congress. You have two houses. The upper house is the Senate, and the lower house is the House of Representatives, because you vote for them to represent um, your your values and your ideas and your um, needs, <clears throat> okay? So those are the ideals. They Just like when we talked about 16th century, 17th century, this, these are important. Keep them in mind, write them down, whatever. Keep them in mind as we talk about other things uh, because we're going to come back to them periodically just to say, okay, this is an example of how one of these things manifest. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is the age of exploration, which I, it's, there's too much for me to explain about all of these things very in a very short time. But basically, uh, Europe is not the center of the world, and it's not the most doesn't have the biggest population, and it didn't even have the uh, political or economic or military power 500 years ago that it would have. But this is sort of one of the catalysts for the development of um, European uh, culture and then American culture and colonization of the Americas comes directly out of this um, effort to map the world, to find new places. The driving force obviously is money, is resources and money. And uh, as as the the most important example, there are many people who go to different places. Jacques Cartier goes to, to uh, new, what will become New France and eventually Canada. Um, and Vasco da Gama is a Portuguese guy who goes around the horn of Africa, goes around the bottom of Africa, and he reaches India. But Columbus decides to find out whether going across um, the Atlantic and to get to China or India and the Philippines and the islands and Japan and Korea. Um, although most people are not really aware of Korea's 
you know, significance in East Asia at this point. Um, they, they just think, but uh, anyway, Japan is the farthest east. So Columbus thinks if he sails across the ocean, eventually he's going to get to, he's going to bump into the islands of Japan, or he's going to bump into Indonesia. <clears throat> um, so he, he basically, he needs money. He needs support in order to do this. He can't do this on his own. He's, it's sort of like being a businessman. He goes to different kings and queens, including Henry the Seventh in England, who you may remember, Henry VIII's father, and the guy who was really stingy, um, didn't like high-risk things. He pitched to his idea that he was going to go try and find a, a route to China and India, um, going over the ocean, and he's nobody's interested until he gets to Spain. So Columbus. Some people think he's Spanish because he was flying the flag of the Spanish Empire and he was the one who started turning Spain into an em empire, but he was not Spanish. Um, he had nothing to do with the development of the Spanish Empire or any of the other things that happen, um, conquering natives and everything. But his attitude of the reason the title in the textbook, and you can read this now about Columbus is there, of course. Um, we're probably going to handle, it's already, we're already over 30 minutes, so we're probably going to talk about the 13 colonies next class. So I'll take that off <clears throat> and uh, we'll talk about that next class. But this is on page 133. Um, the title I gave it was Master Navigator and Genocidal Governor. That's pretty harsh. And um, I don't regret saying that, though, uh, because once Columbus realized that the natives didn't have the in the islands, he was uh, the, the people that he met were called the Arawak. <clears throat> Specifically, I can't remember there. There's different tribes of Arawak, but like kind of a overarching you know, term for the people that lived in the islands of the Caribbean, um, the people, we call them Arawak. And um, so they were one of the first people to, I mean, the, it was first contact for uh, European countries since the Vikings went to Canada um, hundreds of years before. So Europeans had come to uh, North America before and we don't know about all the contacts, but this is not truly for first contact, but this is from this point, from, from Columbus sailing across the ocean in the three ships, the Nina, the Pinta, the Santa Maria. Um, that's actually a lyric from a song. That's why I can remember it so easily. The Nina, the Pinta, the Santa Maria. Those are uh, very Spanish names. Three, name, three ships, um, not very good quality, apparently. He managed to get across the Atlantic Ocean in a few months, and uh, he made contact with the native people there, which they were part of a larger group of people um, that are called Arawak. So characteristics of these people um, are kind of unique. They were mostly shorter than the Spanish. Um, they don't, they didn't have metal, they didn't have horses, uh, they didn't have ships. So when the Spanish arrived and got out of these gigantic sh ships, um, well, they, they would say they were gigantic. Um, they, they were amazed um, and surprised. And every time this happens, basically the native tribe at first will be like, you know, basically like aliens are landing here. Who are these people? Where did they come from? They, they're human beings. They look like us, but they have, you know, different, they're covered in metal. For example, the Spanish, you know, they're wearing their armor um, and they have swords and they have guns and um, they have these big animals. There were no horses. Some people don't realize in North America, native people started riding horses and became experts. But it, this is 1492, right? Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492. Um, so that at this point, there's horses went extinct. Um, 
there's a, there's, there was sort of an environmental catastrophe in North and South America where all of the larger animals died. So other than a llama, um, which is kind of like a really angry camel um, in South America, there's, there's not large um, animals to do work or to, to ride on. Um, and this is another disadvantage that the native people have. The most important disadvantage they have is their um, immune systems are weaker because they don't live in cities. And these Arawak people are very peaceful. They, there seems to be no evidence of them having, you know, intertribal warfare, partly maybe because they're living on islands and they're separated from each other and um, there's no need for it. Uh, the population of the, 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 the land can support the population the way that their society is organized. So it's often when people come across an island, sometimes this happens, you know, not anymore because we have satellites and we map the whole world, but um, it, ha it happened hundreds of times that people, Europeans or otherwise, have found, come across an island where there's people living there and they have sort of a unique society because they're separated from all the other people. They don't have to worry about uh, other nations, other tribes, other um, cultures or values because they're, they're a small self-contained society. So they're very vulnerable um, to disease and um, to, they don't have weapons. Um, they probably have hunting tools and things like that, but basically there's nothing they can do to fight back against uh, the Spanish if they choose to take advantage of them. And that's basically what Columbus does. He gets increasingly frustrated. He calls them Indians and it never goes away. Everybody calls them Indians for hundreds of years. People still call them Indians. And nobody knows why he kept insisting because he obviously knew that this is not India. This is, there's none of the things that he wanted. None of these people speak the right language or look. There's no gigantic cities. There's no spices. There's no silk. There's no Chinese people or Indian people. So why does he insist on calling them Indians? Maybe he never wanted to admit that he made a mistake or that he was wrong. But that's, I, there's no reason to speculate because we can never know what Columbus was thinking, other than the fact that I, he was trying to develop a trade system. He was trying to um, establish, you know, um, he's trying to run a business and there wasn't anything value to, valuable to bring back. So he threatened the native people and some, in some cases he, you know, enslaved them, exploited them, moved them to different islands, brought them back to Spain. Um, he brought different, um, you know, indigenous plants, um, but nothing really valuable to the king and queen of Spain. So obviously, fast forward after Columbus dies, um, they discover Mexico and, and start exploring and conquering Mexico and they find gold there. And in South America, they find silver when... Um, it's Hernan Cortez in Mexico and um, Pizarro, Francisco Pizarro in uh, South America. You don't have to remember those names, though. Just the fact that Mexico has gold and S South America, Peru in particular, uh, in the mountains, they have silver. And this will make Spain incredibly rich. But Columbus um, reaches America, goes back and forth three or four times and then dies before the Spanish Empire starts to really expand and, and uh, extract resources. So uh, he's behaving no different than any other governor would behave for the Spanish Empire. He's trying to make money. He's trying to trade and control the local population and the resources. But the result is that the Arawak are completely wiped out. They, the people are, that's what genocide means. You kill an entire group of people. So the result of the contact between Christopher Columbus or Christophe Colombo, is, he's originally from Italy. I don't think I mentioned that, but he's from Genoa. Um, it's an Italian city-state 
and uh, he he ends up just completely destroying their society, and it, they have the population collapses um, through exploitation, enslavement, disease, um, and occupation. Um, Hispaniola becomes the name of the island, which will in the future be Haiti, as you say, and, and Puerto Rico and uh, Haiti in the future. It'll be half Spanish and half French uh, in the future. But uh, for now, it's, it's just a, a sort of, it's a popular, it's a disaster for the Arawak people. So um, that's why there is a holiday called Columbus Day in America, which is very controversial because it, it, a lot of people feel that he's not a person we should be celebrating because he started a process, not on purpose, but um, without considering at all um, the, the, the Indian, he did not consider the North American native peoples as uh, human beings on the same level as his own. He considered them as lesser people. And so he treated them accordingly, um, which is uh, something that we are against uh, in the 21st century, right? Okay, so that's good. Um, that's the Wednesday lecture. Thank you for listening to it. I know I stumbled along a few times. Hopefully that will, um, I've warmed up a little bit and I can do another lecture and post it today as well. Thank you for being patient and understanding um, my delays because of hospitalization. And uh, I'll see you on Friday. Have a good day.